but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, for God shows no partiality. All who have sinned apart from the law will also perish apart from the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous in God's sight, but the doers of the law who will be justified. When Gentiles who do not possess the law do instinctively what the law requires, these, though not having the law, are a law to themselves. They show that what the law requires is written on their hearts to which their own conscience also bears witness, and their conflicting thoughts will accuse or perhaps excuse them on the day when, according to my gospel, God, through Jesus Christ, will judge the secret thoughts of all. Let's pray. Lord, this has been a troubling week in our nation. And I think we would be remiss if we did not lift up those who have filled the airwaves this past week. We pray for Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, Lauren Ahrens, Michael Kroll, Patrick Zamaripa, Brent Thompson, Michael Smith, and even Micah Johnson. These high-profile shootings, Lord, have again highlighted our brokenness. We do not often live as you would wish, united, but instead live divided. We ask that you bring comfort and strength to each of these persons, families, whose lives have been lost, and we ask for healing to come to their communities. And now, Lord, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us as we now look at how we should treat others who may believe differently than we do. Guide and direct our thoughts in my words this day and always. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, how many of you have ever encountered someone who practices a different religion than you do at work or school or out in the community? Raise your hand. All right, quite a few of you. It's hard to see with the lights, but quite a few of you it looks like. And if you have not, you surely will because today there are approximately 1.2 billion followers of Christianity, 1.5 billion followers of Islam, 900 million followers of Hinduism, 376 million followers of Buddhism, and 14 million followers of Judaism in the world, just to name a few. In fact, the top 10 religions account for over 5.6 billion of the 7.4 billion inhabitants on the earth today. That's around 76% of the world's population claim to have a religion of some sort. Because our world is becoming more and more diverse and we have easy access to information just about anywhere and at any time, uh, usually right there in our pockets, um, faith questions routinely pop into our minds and into our conversations with others that we never even, uh, no one thought even to ask or definitely didn't answer uh, back when you were learning things in Sunday school when you were a kid. Back then, typically, if you were born into a Christian family, then you were a Christian. And if you're born into a Jewish family or a Muslim family, then that is the re religion that you followed. As a result, most people had little knowledge of or exposure to other religions. Well, that is simply not the case today. 
You can easily find out what other religions believe with a simple Google search or by watching a couple of YouTube videos on the internet. Then you can travel just a short distance to experience a different faith community in person. And today, many people are trying out different faiths, seeking out what seems to fit for them. But in all of these searches, people are typically seeking a real encounter of God and some sense of ultimate truth. Some religions teach that there are many paths to truth, while others teach that there is only one way to truly know God. With so many options and so much information uh, trying to convince us of the merits and also of the limitations of a particular religion, you know, can only one religion be true? That really does become a question that we have to answer. We must, we must first understand that any choice among religions and their respective truth claims is an act of faith. Let me repeat that. Any choice among religions and their respective truth claims is an act of faith. So however, so however is choosing no religion or choosing some other philosophy of life. Uh, both of those things, either faith or non-faith, or just not really knowing what you believe exactly, all of those things are uh, faith, uh, require acts of faith. Quickly, I want to hit on four approaches to how we can look at truth that are highlighted in United Methodist Bishop Scott Jones and Arthur Jones's book entitled Ask Faith Questions in a Skeptical Age, uh, where we kind of tied in the title of this series. Relativism is the, f relativism is the first one. Relativism believes that truth is relative to each person's perspective and is not universal. It places a high value on individual choice and tolerance of others. Relativists may pick and choose what they believe to be the best parts of various religions. The downside is, is that there is no objective truth outside of what you create for yourself, and there is no common aim for human life that we all should be working towards or something that holds us all together. Agnosticism is another way. The word agnostic comes from two Greek words, a, which is for not, and gnostic, which means knowing. So this is not knowing. Agnostics believe that there is no way to know what is true, or even if there is truth about God, uh, there is no way for humans to know. We have, don't have the ability to know. At Thursday night worship, a couple of people afterwards said, well, isn't that kind of what we believe um, as Christians, that we don't really know all there is to know of God. And yes, that is true. We as Christians do believe in the mystery of God. But there are things that we do also know. We believe that in Jesus Christ, God has definitively and physically revealed himself to us in flesh and blood in Jesus Christ. In John 14, 7, Jesus says, if you know me, you will know my father also. From now on, because you know me, uh, you know my Father also. Uh, so it is clear that we can know God, and it is, his desire, it is his desire to reconcile all creation through Jesus. Well, back to agnosticism for a minute. Agnostics often think that since truth claims of religious people cannot be empirically verifiable, that they are not holding intelligent and reasoned opinions. Agnosticism also can paralyze people and keep them from acting in any direction because, well, I don't know what's true, so I'll just kind of do this for a while and then this for a while. It doesn't really matter. I, I'll just do whatever I feel like. In the book, of the, life, the book, The Life of Pi, the author writes, to choose doubt as a philosophy in life is like choosing immobility as a means of transportation. That's kind of the idea here. You just kind of get stuck in a rut and don't know where to go. Atheism in its popular form today is based on a philosophy known as materialism. Basically that the material world is composed of matter and energy, which constitutes the only reality. God is therefore not necessary to provide truth or to explain anything. This attitude leads to a complete loss of transcendence and often a meaningless or amoral understanding of the world. Then the fourth way that we can understand truth is through the lens of religion. And that's what we're going to focus on today. All religions make truth claims about ultimate reality, and those claims directly affect how people live their lives. 
And most religions hold a lot of things in common. Uh, they believe in a divine being. Most of them believe in just one God. They believe in a spiritual part of, of each person that lives on oftentimes after death. They believe in life after death. Uh, they show compassion for others, especially the poor and the oppressed. Uh, they have a belief that our attitude toward God should include worship, that we should have praise to God, prayers, reading of sacred texts, and offerings to God. And they possess a set of moral codes or laws that are to guide their followers in faithful living. Well, of course, there are always some exceptions to that. You know, some have multiple gods and have other different beliefs. Um, but many hold those things in common. But something that we must always remember is that all religions also have followers of, followers of their faith who have taught and practiced things that violate the core tenets of their religion. People of all faiths throughout history have been at times misguided and even radicalized. Sadly, Pope Urban II's promises made in 1095 to fighters in the Crusades sound awfully familiar to the religious promises made to some terrorists today. But while any religious person can go bad, and that's really key there, I think, is, you know, we can't lump everybody together. Um, a religious person can go bad, but religion, at its best, attempts to connect human beings with what they understand to be the ultimate reality. Faith, then, is a decision to live according to a set of beliefs about God, the world, and our purpose in life. Things that cannot be objectively proven. So all of us have to ultimately choose, uh, based on faith, what religion we will follow. Then once you have cho chosen to have faith, uh, the next step is recognizing that ultimately only one religion can be true. There are faith claims that are mutually exclusive. There can be one God, or there can be many gods. You can't have it both ways. Uh, in heaven, we'll either find Jesus, or we'll find Muhammad on the throne at the right hand of God the Father. Jesus is the Messiah, or Jesus is not the Messiah. Each option requires a faith choice and they cannot all be right. I choose to believe and have faith that Christianity is the truth. I believe Jesus is God incarnate and is the definitive revelation to the world of who God is. As a Christian, I do believe Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through the Son. But I do not believe this is meant as an exclusionary claim as it is sometimes used by people who quote this passage from John 14. The statement that no one comes to the Father except, th except through me, I believe is a truth claim made by Jesus to help us firmly grasp our evangelistic mission to the world as followers of Christ. Jesus' great commission in Matthew 28 reminds us that we are to go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And then Jesus says he will be with us always as we carry out this mission into the world. But we cannot ever forget that this mission has as its primary weapon not assault rifles and IEDs, but love. Jesus makes this clear at the Last Supper before he would be betrayed, arrested, and sentenced to death for his extreme love. In John 13, 34, and 35, Jesus said to his disciples, Then, and to any who follow him today, I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. And you can notice that there are no asterisks or stars or footnote exclusions to this love. We may wish that there were, but Jesus' Jesus's one another love is a love so broad that it includes all of the one another's in the whole wide world. 
It is clear that if we are to follow Jesus, we must honor his commands to love God and our neighbor. And lest we forget, he also included enemies in this love, whether we like it or not. And I have a feeling many of us don't like it. Love and gracious reconciliation were at the core of Jesus' life and ministry, and they're at the core of the church's mission in the world today. Jesus saying, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me is a wide and expansive claim. What Jesus does not say here is also critically important. He does not say how or in what manner people get to know, get to know God through him. He simply claims that whatever God is doing in the world to know and redeem and love and restore the world is happening in and through him. Because of Jesus and this good news, I am a Christian. The last step once you have chosen in faith to follow a particular religion is to then decide how within one's religions, one's religious commitments, believers should view other religions. For Christians, the first place to start is with a humble spirit and listening to the voice of the one who is the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. None of us, after all, saves anyone. Salvation is God's business and well above any of our pay grades. I have no doubt that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and all who are reconciled to God are reconciled through him. And I also have no doubt that it is Christ's desire that all creation would be saved. How would a loving creator of all things desire anything less? Sometimes we get off track and try to play God or project our own thoughts onto God, especially related to who is in and who is out. I think especially in times like these, where we are constantly encouraged to build up walls and divisions between people and religions, we must regularly go back to the Jesus we find in Scripture and ask ourselves, in what way does my thinking about God conform to what I find in Jesus? It's easy for us to create God in our own image, an image that at times may have little resemblance to Jesus. In her book, Bird by Bird, Anne Lamott points out, you can safely assume you've created God in your own image when it turns out that God hates all the same people you do. But if we read the Gospels closely, we see this pesky Jesus just keeps saying things that throw the door of salvation uh, open wider and wider. Yes, he says the gate is narrow in Matthew 7. But he also says he is the gate in John 10. And if Jesus is the gate, he gets to decide the dimensions of narrow. Not us. That alone might give us pause on thinking that we are the judge of people of other religions. But Jesus continues in John 10, 14, and 16. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. We may not all be of one fold, but Christ is drawing us all together. In John 12, 32, Jesus says, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Here is that word again, all people. It seems Jesus is determined to reclaim all that is his. Well, now, before you start calling me a universalist, I see some of you out there whispering to your neighbor. I do believe that God allows everyone to, who has heard the good news of the gospel to choose faith in Christ or reject it. You can reject God. You have free will to choose that destiny, but I do not believe that this is God's desire for anyone. God's desire is to draw all things, all of his creation 
to himself. I believe C.S. Lewis puts it well when he writes, the gates of hell are locked from the inside. But if we truly want to see God, then we look to Jesus. And Jesus seems far more interested in saving people than he is in whether they get everything right. Jesus is constantly breaking down barriers that we seem bent on building back up. As Jesus is dying on the cross, you maybe remember the veil of the temple is ripped open. This gigantic uh, veil is ripped in two. Shane Claiborne observes, it is as if to say God cannot be held hostage. God is bigger than our images, icons, and even our temples. God doesn't need mediators and isn't confined to the Holy of Holies. God is alive in the world and is in the streets. God can heal people with dirt and spit. God can fry fish. God is with us. No longer do we have to go to the temple to find God. God has come and found us in Jesus. Jesus affirms people whenever they do something redemptive, whether they have all the right beliefs or not. Just think for a minute about that scandalous parable of the Good Samaritan that you've all heard before. Jesus says something like this. So this guy is traveling on the uh, uh, Jericho Road and um, he gets beat up and thrown in the ditch. Then a priest comes along and passes right by on his way to worship. Then comes along a Levite, a very religious person, and he also passes by without doing anything because he's running late for a trustees meeting. We have priorities, you know. And then comes the Samaritan. And you can almost hear the crowd chuckle since Jews didn't even walk through Samaria, much less talk to or touch a Samaritan. But it is the Samaritan who takes care of the guy in the ditch. This story is all about challenging who is in and who is out. The religion of the first two guys did nothing to move them to compassion, but the Samaritan, who didn't believe the right things according to the Jews, shows compassion and is hailed by Jesus as the hero of the story. And I'm sure the listeners were ticked off. Just like some of you, I'm sure, will be by the end of this sermon. According to the religious elite, Samaritans did not have sound doctrine or keep the right rules. But Jesus shows that true faith has to work itself out in a way that is good news to the most bruised and broken person lying in the ditch. The point is clear. God may indeed be evident in a priest, but God is just as likely to be at work through a Samaritan. And this is exactly the challenge we see over and over again in Jesus. He says to the religious folks, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. And you might wonder, if we can't break people up into clearly defined groupings, then how will we control who is in and who is out? And that's precisely the point. That is not our job to do. We are not to separate the weeds from the wheat. That's God's job. Evangelical pastor and writer Tony Campolo observes, the love of God encompasses far more people than I am ready to accept. As Methodist Christians, we believe in something known as pervenient grace. This is God's grace that comes before, that is active in the lives of all people, which comes before any declaration of faith, drawing us toward salvation. Jones writes, there are many valid and valuable beliefs and practices in other religions. Many religions teach moral values such as loving our neighbors, caring for the poor, respecting creation, practicing prayer, 
and working for the common good. We look at those beliefs and practices and say that God was at work through that other religion to help people come as close to the truth as possible, given their culture and history. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, approached the salvation of people outside the Christian faith by saying that God will judge us all according to how we use the grace that we have been given. Thus, people from other religions may be saved. Wesley views, Wesley's view leads us to a spiritual attitude of openness where we can work together and learn from other religions while remaining faithfully and fully committed to Jesus Christ. John 1, 1 to 4 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and without Him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in Him was life, and the life was the light of all people. Christ is the light of all I'm going to share an illustration that will probably get some people riled up. I got a few riled up on Thursday night, so I'm just guessing it might do the same for you. I want you to let it bang around a little bit because I think it's one of those that maybe if we think about it more, um, we see how it's just an illustration of the expansiveness of God's grace and mercy. C.S. Lewis in the last book of the Chronicles of Narnia describes a scene in which a soldier who was a follower of Tash, made it into heaven and was surprised to find Aslan the lion there. Aslan is uh, the Christ figure in these stories. The soldier who had spent his whole life following a different religion was amazed first to find out the truth that Aslan was there sitting as the king. And second, to be accepted into heaven through believing in a different religion. He couldn't believe that could be. Aslan told him that all good deeds done in the name of Tash were offerings made to Aslan. And all the evil deeds done in the name of Aslan were offered to Tash. In Acts chapter 10, 34 to 35, when Peter, who is called the rock, gets up to preach, he says... I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. For as Paul says in our reading from Romans this morning, for it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous in God's sight, but the doers of the law who will be justified. As Christians, we must stand in the extreme center where we can respect and love people who follow other religions on one hand and on the other hand stand firm in the promises of Jesus, the Savior of the world, who is the way, the truth, and the life. We must hold these two in tension and love is the glue that binds them together. Christians have a strong obligation both to love our neighbors and to evangelize them, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with them. In his book, The Evangelistic Love of God and Neighbor, Scott Jones writes, to evangelize non-Christian persons without loving them is not to evangelize them well. We have to love them first. Build a relationship. Serve by their side. Unite around the things that we have in common. Then he goes on, to love non-Christians, Christian persons without evangelizing them is not to love them well either. You know, if, if we believe that salvation comes through Christ, then we're not willing to share it with people who are close to us, even if they have another religion. Do we really love them? And then he continues, loving God well means loving one's non-Christian neighbor evangelistically and evangelizing one's non-Christian neighbor lovingly. I hope and pray that we can move to a place where we are not scared of dialogue 
friendship and common service with people who practice other religions because that does not mean we have to be any less zealous about our love for Jesus or our hope for others to experience that love. One day you may be hanging out in a coffee shop somewhere and suddenly your non-Christian friend might say, okay, I don't want a long complicated answer, but tell me this, how can you believe that only Christianity is true when there are so many other religions out there? You know, what would you say? Well, you might say something like this. I believe Christianity is true. I know believing it is an act of faith, but picking any religion is an act of faith, or even picking no religion at all. I respect other religions, and I'm sure God can work through them all, but I've experienced God's loving presence through Jesus, and I can't deny it. We all choose something. And I've chosen to follow Jesus, and I believe he is the Savior of the world. May the grace and peace of Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, be with us all as we grapple with God's expansive love for you and for your neighbor in this coming week. Amen.